Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our February Brown Bag Lunch. My name is Danielle Bergen. I'm the Community Coordinator at Mental Health America of Hawaii. And today we have an excellent Brown Bag Lunch with Dr. Adam Coles uh, called Eating Disorders in Hawaii. And the basics, Adam, uh, Dr. Coles will be discussing the basics of eating disorders and the state of treatment options in Hawaii and beyond. Uh, Dr. Coles is a child and adolescent and adult psychiatrist who is the clinical director of the Maui Family Guidance Center and is also the medical director at IPONO Hawaii. Dr. Coles is also a member of our Mental Health America Board of Directors and is on our Maui Advisory Board. So with that, I am gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, it's really good to be back for a brown bag. I love these things. Um, I think they're just one of the best things Mental Health America does for our community, um, just really kind of pulling people together uh, from a lot of different um, perspectives and professions and um, around kind of mental health, you know, and the, the really important kind of challenges that we face. Um, and I was, I was excited by this topic uh, because I've been kind of involved in trying to assess and expand um, treatment options for eating disorders um, here on Maui for the you know past year, year and a half or so um, through Ipona and then through our affiliated kind of foundation. And we're just, we're still cranking the, the engine a little bit on that, like pulling the cord on a lawnmower. Um, it's been very difficult, you know, in the post COVID era, um, and uh, but we're aware, you know, as as so many of us are of the just the challenges and the limitations and treatment options. Um, before I get into the slides, which uh, for me are a little bit text heavy, um, more than I tend to go. Um, if anyone's ever seen me give a chat before, I tend to be kind of extemporaneous. I like to use whiteboards. I like to draw and use pictures. Um, but there's just a lot of information to cover. So I'm gonna kind of go through a, a kind of broad, um, just overview of the basics, you know, what are eating disorders? What are the main types? Um, and then kind of get into sort of the process of accessing help in a more generalized fashion, no matter where you are and you know, where you live, what, what would it kind of look like? Um, what are some of the challenges and then what are some of the options that we have kind of in our community in our environment uh, in Maui, on Maui, and then, you know, in Hawaii more in general. And I really want to try and save some time at the end for just discussion and questions, because that's really where real kind of information and nuts and bolts comes out. So I may go a little quickly. Um, I'll apologize in advance. <laughs> but a lot of the information I'm going to go over in the beginning will be stuff that you could access online, you know, through many excellent websites and, and books, for those who still like reading those. Um, and they're available on the websites I have at the end of the slideshow as well. Um, but it's just, I wanted to make sure we're kind of all talking about the same thing, sort of on the same page first, and then we'll kind of, we'll get into it. So I'm going to go ahead and share screen. Oh, I should say, um, toward the end, we're trying to get some questions and stuff. Um, go ahead and send chats in as, you know, with your question and then myself and our other co-hosts can see those and that way you can send questions anonymously if you want um def definitely don't have to but um that's always a really good way to kind of send those in and then we'll get into it we'll do that and then we'll do that there we go okay so um this is me, uh, Adam Coles. Um, going to talk a little bit about eating disorders today. The quote underneath it uh, is from an, a mentor of mine, my first, my first mentor in child psychiatry. Actually, it is all around us till it touches us. She said this to me while we were in the elevator one day. Um, a colleague had actually presented for treatment um, in in our hospital, and uh, I was I was a resident. Uh, oh, sorry, I was actually a fourth year medical student sub intern. And, you know, it was it was it was a big deal, you know, for me at the time. And um, that's what that's how she responded to me. She's Parisian and just had these ways of just sort of 
encapsulating things in a single statement that kind of grabbed everything. And I think that it just, I think about that a lot because um, it is all of us as well, like um, mental health and mental illness and mental wellness is something that we all, I think, have to grapple with. And that's part of our task is to remove stigma around that. So uh, as Danielle mentioned, uh, I need to disclose that I'm medical director of IPONO. It is a private for profit residential treatment center for eating disorders um, and president of the IPONO Foundation, uh, which is our nonprofit kind of affiliated uh, program to try and improve access and education around eating disorders. Um, this is not a presentation that is designed to advertise for IPONO, although I may talk about their program a little bit. And I have no other commercial associations or interests. Um, before we get super into it, um, just move these over a little bit so I can see. There we go. Um, some of these subjects and ideas and the symptoms we talk about can, can be difficult. Um, and so if you need to send us a chat and Dr. Gass can pull you into a breakout room if you want, just take a minute um, or just even step away yourself and um, do what you need to do to, to get through. And, and I wanna um, just kind of offer that um, Ms. Tisa might be available to chat with you after. And then uh, if you feel like things are really ramping up for you, um, feel free to access the mental health access line, uh, which we all do uh, through CAMD as well, um, or text Aloha to 741741, and someone can text chat with you as well. So just a teeny little bit about me, I've had a nonlinear career um, from Colorado originally. Uh, everybody knows who knows me, I'm a pretty nerdy guy, love science fiction, fantasy, art and things like that. Um, and as a result, I wanted to be a, an astronaut. So I went and studied aerospace at Colorado. Couldn't be an astronaut, but was a little engineer for a little while and then moved to study architecture um, in Michigan. Froze my, uh, froze for a while uh, <laughs> out there and then came back to Colorado and was an engineer architect for the US Antarctic program. Um, and actually began to get interested in um, psychological aspects of populations there because it was a very isolated environment, um, far away from kind of civilization. Um, during that time, I was laid off after 9-11. And while I was working at a small firm back in Denver, I started, I returned to the idea of going to medical school and started volunteering in the Denver Health MICU. Uh, I didn't really know at the time I was volunteering, but there was there was a section of the MICU that was um, part of the medical stabilization team. The a service that I'm going to talk about later didn't exist at that time, um, but they would stabilize some folks with uh, severe eating disorders. And then I went to University of Colorado Medical School and did residency and fellowship there in child psychiatry. And then I really began to get my formal training in it, uh, in eating disorders at Children's Hospital Colorado as part of that residency program. And then at Denver Health uh, on the acute service before I became an attending there until I moved to Maui, um, getting close to eight years ago now, which is crazy to think about, and took a job at Ipono Maui as their medical director in 2018. Um, so it's been a really, um, it's, I've had a lot of variety and it's been a very fulfilling kind of job over there. So today we'll talk about, this is by Hay Ridge, by the way, really fun trail when it's not raining and muddy like it probably is right now. Um, although it's kind of fun in the mud, it's just a little dangerous, but um, uh, we're going to talk about eating disorders kind of in general. What are they? What's going on with them? Um, how do we kind of break them down? uh you know in a, in a kind of conceptual framework um where is the field kind of going what do we think about that maybe not isn't formally recognized yet but what do we talk about in terms of future directions how do we evaluate treatment in general and then some hawaii options so what are they um i actually have spent some time thinking about this because uh a lot of times you're sort of with a patient, um, they're telling you, you know, their story and you're kind of thinking, you know, a lot of us are trained to sort of think diagnostically, but, but 
we're really trained to think form formatively to try and get a good picture, you know. And I think it's important to think about what does that mean, um, and how do we define, you know, what an eating disorder is. So I just went to some sources just to see, you know, how some of these big organizations define these things. So NIM, National Institutes of Mental Health, defines it this way. You guys can read this, but I'll pull out some of the big points, you know, serious, sometimes fatal. I think that's very important. Um, illnesses that cause disturbance to a person's eating behaviors. And then they also list obsessions with food, body size, weight, and shape um, are also important aspects. NIDA, the uh, National Eating Disorder Association, um, similar, um, also recognize how serious, but treatable. And I think that that's a really nice addition um, to our kind of definition. Mental and physical illnesses, also, again, I think a good addition. And that can affect people of all genders, ages, races, religions, ethnicities, sexual orientations, body shapes and weights. And I think that those are some really excellent additions to how we think about these things. Um, the National Association of Anorexia Nervosa and Associated Disorders, ANAD, uh, which is a really long name. I'm really glad they have an acronym. Um, adds that they're kind of related thoughts and emotions to the behaviors, that there's this connection between behaviors and thoughts and feelings, which is a an important connection and also kind of recalls uh, the CBT triangle, cognitive behavioral therapy of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And I think that's that can be an important aspect in treatment. So kind of pulling together some of these important um, conceptual ideas that these are illnesses and they have physical and mental aspects and they have a behavioral and an emotional and, and cognitive or conceptual component um, that, that really disturb or pull sideways normal nutritive eating patterns. Um, they are very serious, um, but are treatable and they can also affect anyone. And I think that's one of the things that's really important message that we want to send and we're trying to send you know through the foundation and, and mental health america and all the other efforts is um trying to puncture some of that mythology about eating disorders and who suffers from them how big of a problem are they well rather big <laughs> um and when i started pulling up statistics um one of the interesting things was that national institutes of mental health have very old statistics uh, up on their site. And I dug around a little bit more and just to just to see, and they actually, their more recently published statistics from 2016 actually are referencing data from like as early as 2003. Um, so it was a little bit disappointing there, but other organizations keep more recent numbers like NIDA keeps a really good database and so does ANED. Um, but from what we can tell, at least by 2020, um, they affect, you know, kind of one slice but between nine and ten percent of the global population, um, and about the same percentage of Americans will have an incidence of an eating disorder in their lifetime. Um, in my day job as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, I was, I found it sobering to see that, excuse me, less than 6% of teens who have an eating disorder were underweight. And that means that many will fly under the diagnostic radar, which we'll talk about a little bit later in terms of weight stigma. Um, there's definitely a genetic component. Um, we can follow that from twin studies, um, as well as familial, you know, tracking of illnesses. However, it's quite a variable um, percentage, depending on the review and the study that you're looking at. And I think what that really actually speaks to is that this is such a broad range of disorders. You're looking at a multivariate population of disorders with a varying amount of genetic load, you know, for each one in each individual case. Um, so in that way, they are very similar to several of our other mental, you know, illnesses like depression, like anxiety, uh, and so they they really come out as a mixture of genetic vulnerability and environmental triggers and stressors. Um, 
last I checked, it's still the highest mortality rate among mental illnesses that are non-substance related, meaning like opioid overdose um, disorders. And folks, uh, about 25% of people with an uh, eating disorder will attempt suicide at least once. And with over 10,000 people per year by 2020 um, completing. It does affect all genders, ethnicities, ages from five to 80. And I, I wanted to point that out because um, even in my business, child and adolescent psychiatry, uh, we've watched the ages of presentation drop uh, from the day I walked into the My Family Guidance Center to kind of present, I would say just, just anecdotally, um, you know, the average age has dropped from like 13 age presentation down to like nine or 10 at times. And um, that's a sobering realization as well. There is still a identified female um, greater than male ratio, still about two to one, um, but plenty of, you know, identified male patients present with eating disorders and a greater proportion of uh, transgender folks do as well, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, among minority populations, um, the data all says, you know, that we, we're poor at even picking them up um, and diagnosing folks and of fewer number of people actually present with that complaint and they're not very, they're not screened nearly as often as their white peers um, and half is likely to be diagnosed or treated. However, we actually see that um, when we do cross-sectional studies that black teens, for instance, and Hispanics are actually more likely to experience symptoms of uh, purging, binge eating, symptoms of bulimia and dieting uh, than their peers. Among Asian American college students uh, across the board, they report higher rates of restrictive behaviors. Now, this was a, a cross-sectional study, and it didn't really pull up eating disorder diagnoses, but more behaviors like dieting, body image dissatisfaction, um, extreme health behaviors, including like heavy working out, uh, possible use of performance enhancing drugs to, you know, do weightlifting and things like that. Um, kind of the, the fitness and body beautiful thing is very strong on this population. Uh, among LGBTQ uh, and eating disorder populations, gay and bisexual males uh, them report a significantly higher rate of fasting, binge episodes, dieting, medication, and laxative use. And almost nine in 10 LGBTQ youth report body dissatisfaction, incredibly high rate. Um, and of those that report that, almost they exhibit almost twice the rate of suicide attempts as those who report um, relatively relative body satisfaction. And transgender college students report twice the rate of disordered eating behaviors as their cisgendered peers. So a very large problem and we're not doing a good job screening and diagnosing and treating folks. Um, not a lot of data here, but among the disabled population, the medically disabled population, um, women with disabilities have a much higher rate of developing a separate eating disorder. Um, and then there's a developing, and this is going to be an area of research, I think, or is an area of research that's going to grow, um, an association between eating disorders and the autism spectrum population. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that more later, because um, one of the centers we work with is very interested in this uh, as an ongoing area of research but there's been an increased association between autism and specifically anorexia nervosa, but also all cause eating disorders, all types. Um, there was an interesting study out of Harvard that actually looked at the sort of societal um, cost, economic, as well as other costs of eating disorder, what kind of impact do they have beyond the individual and family? And uh, came up with quite a sobering number that, that the direct kind of health care and consequence cost is upwards of $64 billion a year, just in direct costs alone, and more like over $300 billion in direct costs and losses 
to you know family life, education, health benefits, work, productivity, um, all that stuff in in terms of lost opportunity and lost um, contribution, you know, to the society. So an immense financial as well as societal cost. Okay, so just moving more specifically into kind of what we're kind of here to talk about. Um, so I say the, the eating disorders, you know, when I first started training, there was discussion about, but um, the fourth one hadn't yet come in as a formal diagnosis. So the big now four um, are anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, and avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, disorder um, which we call ARFID because who wants to say that long name all the time? Um, so that was, um, that came in, you know, in the DSM-5 and had been talked about for some time. Research was growing and there was enough to say, yeah, there's, this is a distinct clinical entity that you can assess for and has a distinct symptom um, kind of pathway. Definition-wise, anorexia nervosa presents with a re severe restriction of food intake that is inadequate for their needs, um, accompanied by an intense fear of weight gain and a sense of being overweight, even if they're not, or even if underweight. And there is an atypical version, but um, under anorexia, there are a couple of types. There's the pure restricting type, and then there's the binge purge subtype. And it's important to remember that um, even of the binge purge subtype, the the restriction and the, the fear of the weight gain and the tendency toward weight loss and underweight is still the primary symptom, even though there might be binging purging behavior um, in that compensatory cycle, it's not the primary. And we'll talk more about how do you pull these apart down the road. Bulimia uh, is characterized by repeating cycles of binge episodes and comp compensating or compensatory behavior, as we say, because doctors and Specialists like to make things more complicated to say for some reason. It makes us feel smart. But um, compensating behavior, you know, is often thought of first as, you know, purging by vomiting emesis. But there's a lot of different compensating behaviors, including overexercise, using medications, laxatives, fasting after a binge episode, um, and the sense of self and identity heavily, heavily influenced by size and shape. Um, the picture at the bottom, by the way, I, I found it as part of another project that I was working on, and I just really like it. It's called the Virtuous and, Virtuous and Vicious Cycle, designed as a tattoo, but I just like the simplicity of it. Um, and it's almost like a dark version of yin yang. Um, and I think that that's, I don't know, just very evocative of kind of the mental process, the mental cycle. Um, and I just found it very kind of a powerful visual concept. Um, binge eating disorder, which also is a, a little more recent um, addition to the DSM-5, um, is characterized by recurring episodes of specifically binge eating. Um, it has to be a, a significantly larger amount than a normal meal. And I'll say why that's important, um, coupled with this sense of being sort of out of control. People have told me they're, they're like, they're on a runaway train, they're sort of on a, on a process or a merry-go-round that they just can't get off. And then when a binge episode concludes, it's, off, it's often followed by the sense of guilt and shame, and, um, and then it repeats itself, um, sometimes daily and sometimes more than daily, and sometimes a little bit less often. Um, there are time and and you know frequency criteria for all these things. I didn't put those in this because really folks don't need to know that except people are trying to diagnose these things. Um, it really is more conceptually important to talk about what are the core kind of ideas. Um, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, ARFID. I talk about it being kind of new. Does anybody know who who these people are? Raise your hand if you know, it's okay. It's okay to date yourself a little. Um, one of our care coordinators in the office is a huge, I mean, huge 
New Kids on the Block fan. And she goes to all the concerts, front row all the time, gets pictures, gets autographs. And it's just like, wow, you are a fan. You are a mega fan. So Arfin's the new kid on the block. Um, I think this is actually very helpful. Sometimes, you know, you get a diagnosis into the DSM and you're wondering like, what do we, how do I use this? How is this? How does this change management? But I think ARFID has been a very useful clinical addition. Um, the folks come in and they exhibit this, this reduced interest and or avoidance in food. Um, but without a fear of weight gain, they don't have this drive for thinness. They don't have this strange um, kind of kind of control, you know, obsessive control component or a sense that they're like huge, even though they're tiny. It's the food itself is difficult to take. Um, it has some kind of characteristic or um, meaning for them that's very difficult. And that includes uh, sensory characteristics. Some folks come in and they have a medical issue, whether it's an injury or some kind of medical illness that at some point or even chronically makes it difficult to swallow and eat. And that develops into kind of this separate uh, sort of anxiety, food anxiety. Um, and then of the folks, especially who have sensory problems with food, many have a developmental aspect, like a developmental disability aspect. And so the, the, ra the rate of ARFID among the autism spectrum population, for example, it's just only one example, um, is much, is, is higher than average. And often there's a significant social impact, as you might expect, even within families, among friends, um, because they're offered things that are just intolerable. Um, and one of the other things that's, I think, uh, important about it is that that many want to eat more, want to have a normal relationship with food, but that certain foods are so intolerable it becomes very difficult. There are some other disorders that are you know, part of the part of our diagnostic framework, they're encountered less often, but it's still important and important to to peel out if we if we see something happening. Um, so, pica um, is the eating of non-food things. That's just sort of the general definition. Um, pica is actually. Uh, a very interesting entity for child and adolescent psychiatrists and pediatricians because some children can present with pica um, it, it, as a kind of primary process and it can be for a bunch of different reasons um, and so it, it usually triggers a broad medical and developmental kind of workup um, because among kids who present with pica there is a higher rate of developmental disabilities or functional disabilities like problems with swallowing which can be trained you know with occupational therapy and things like that um among adults who present with new pica um you know that calls for also a broad medical workup um, because sometimes that can um be the result of a specific nutritional deficiency um uh, some and, and sometimes a psychological entity or trauma, uh, probably the top three. Rumination disorder is regurgitation, and then the classic definition is rechewed and swallowed. So, just like kind of you know cows and elk and deer and others that are ruminants, um, kind of you know regurgitating some food substance, chewing and swallowing, but. They don't have to chew and re-swallow, it can be spit out as well. Um, and it tends to be less sort of conscious, if that makes sense, um, this kind of recurring cycle. Um, but people uh, don't like to report it because it has significant stigma around it as well, like many of these symptoms. So sometimes you have to pick up, pick up on it when people present with physical symptoms because it can cause a lot of you know erosion and acid um, in the mouth. Um, and that's part of the assessment that we'll talk about later. And then there's these entities called other specified eating disorders. And they, you'll see that many of them have the same names. Um, 
So atypical anorexia nervosa is, is an anorexic pattern of behavior and psychological drive for thinness and very likely weight loss or weight loss, what I call velocity, meaning they're losing a lot of weight in a shorter amount of time, but still actually within the normal weight range. Um, but really they're, everything else about their presentation looks like anorexia. And then, you know, bulimia nervosa, same behaviors, um, binge purge cycles, you know, um, identity around weight and size, um, but they don't meet time or frequency criteria. Binge eating disorder, that's, that's others, again, not meeting the time or frequency criteria, but, but still having binge episodes. And same with straight, pur not same, but purging disorder is, is what it sounds like. Meals are being eaten, food is being eaten, but not abnormally large or abnormally long and out of control, but um, purging is happening. And also you can have other compensating behaviors. And this is a funny entity I've only run into a couple of times, night eating syndrome. And this is not, I don't wanna frighten anybody. This is not like waking up, you're a little bit hungry, you go get a snack from the fridge. It's really like a shift in the normal eating pattern and I'm normally large uh, at night after like dinner. And, you know, and it's actually disturbing one's pattern. It's disturbing your sleep. It's disturbing your normal kind of eating and digestive process. Um, again, this also doesn't, this doesn't, you know, work for night shift workers, but if they have the pattern during the day when they should be sleeping, you could call that night eating syndrome or day eating syndrome and night workers, whatever. Maybe the DSM folks will ask me my opinion next time. And then um, our catch-all for when we just cannot figure out, given the history and exam, uh, you know, and all the medical work of exactly what's happening. We have our handy unspecified feeding or eating disorder. I think down the road, and a lot of us in the in the business are talking about this now, these things now. Um, orthorexia is a word that's that I'm beginning to hear more. Um, that I've been talking with colleagues about since I was back at Denver Health. Orthorexia. Um, is a term that means the, the, and I'll say an unhealthy obsession with proper healthful eating. Uh, and that's, that's Nita's kind of meaning of it. I think it was coined in the late nineties, like 98 or something. Um, and we're seeing that a lot more. Um, and if, and there is a higher rate of people who kind of report orthorexic symptoms that then go on to develop eating disorders. Um, Anecdotally, I will uh, I will speculate that actually more go on to develop anorexic patterns, but I don't have data to support that. And hopefully somebody will do a study that shows us that. And then um, a few folks, including the Acute Center for Eating Disorders in Denver, which is a medical treatment center for eating disorders uh, in Denver Health Medical Center Hospital, likes to pull out the three different ARFID subtypes. They're not officially part of our diagnostic bag, but this is how I was trained there as well. And, and it, it definitely tracks with what we see among our patient population who come to Maui, that there, there's like the sensory population, there's the lack of interest population where really food doesn't have the same meaning, doesn't occupy the same kind of personal and cultural space. Um, it really is sort of like a kind of, anorexia of 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 the basic kind of sense of food there's just lack of you know hunger um, not a drive to be smaller and then there's the third population which has is characterized by fear of consequences and these are some of those um kind of one of two types where there's a medical problem going on that really gives people fear you know if they've had like um, esophageal problems, swallowing problems, um, even cancer, um, problems with their stomach or digestion, they've had surgery, um, problems with uh, ulcerative colitis or other, you know, inflammatory bowel syndromes, sensitivities to things like, you know, gluten, lactose, other allergies can generate this, this overwhelming fear of certain food types, and then their food variety begins to really decline. Um, 
and you know and and do some kind of begin to pull into this well only certain foods are healthy for me and turn into this sort of orthorexia or an orthorexic subtype possibly again that's even a less official kind of idea but i think we're going to see i think we're going to see these things in in kind of dsm six or seven whenever those happen um most or all of these disorders have potential medical a lot of potential medical complications a lot is made of the complications of anorexia, but all of them really have, you know, some significant potential um, medical problems. Within the realm of anorexia, it gets, it really gets the most attention because I think it's most easy to sort of really understand and pull out if you starve long enough, um, you'll have significant problems in almost every organ system. Um, and it, it becomes so apparent. Um, and really people who present for new evaluation for anorexia typically present in, in medical settings. Um, I mean, just anecdotally among our population, among adults and children or, or teens, you know, many are, are picked up in the kind of medical setting, which I'll talk about. The um, effect on the brain of starvation is... Um, both cognitive and psychological. And what, what I mean by that is there, there are interruptions into the actual cognitive processing problems with memory, attention, uh, working memory, focus, um, computation, spatial memory, spatial, sorry, spatial processing, as well as difficulties with uh, mood, sleep, depression, irritability, emotional reactivity. Um, there are MRI changes, you know, the, the brain is significantly made of fat. So when you starve long enough, you lose your fat stores and that's the insulation on all your wiring in your brain. So it just doesn't work as well. There are serious effects on the cardiovascular system. Um, the starved heart is different than the athletic heart. And we'll talk about that as part of the, the evaluation process, but there are significant effects on the heart that that are picked up first, usually in primary care or settings like that. Um, and some can be lifelong, depending on the severity and the duration. There are changes to the gut. Uh, it tends to slow down uh, and sometimes can develop, you know, full gastroparesis, which is, you know, paralysis of the gut because it's really not working on anything. Uh, and then it takes a while to start up again. Um, a lot of people are aware that um, anorexic, uh, anorexia can generate osteopenia, low bone density, osteoporosis, severe low bone density. Um, it changes our homeostasis in terms of our body temperature and basal metabolic rate uh, and can interrupt the normal hormone cycles. So you can uh, lose your menses, lose your period, um, interrupt ability to have children. And this endocrine abnormalities happen in men too, and it's just less understood. Bulimia um, can generate significant disturbances in your electrolytes and can threaten your heart rhythm, uh, has effects on your entire GI system as, as well as just the body in general. Um, you know, most well known because they're the most visible are the effects on one's, you know, cheeks and parotid glands, the dentition, um, skin of the hands, but also when you get rid of fluid and the acid, it disturbs your uh, acid-based balance in your body, uh, and that can mess up your phosphate and bone density as well. Um, and also your body temperature can fluctuate rapidly with these binge purge cycles. Uh, binge eating disorder, uh, significantly associated with uh, fluctuations in your metabolic state, blood sugar levels, um, you know, and digestive processes as well. And then ARFID really it depends on the clinical presentation. So what is being avoided in terms of food is, or what, can it lead to, it does lead to specific, um, you know, malnutrition states rather than global undernutrition, just missing some key nutrition components. Um, looks like there's a question. Is there data on the percentage of people with multiple disorders and how it affects their success in treatment? Good question. I will come back to that. Just don't let me forget, Daniel. There we 
go. Oops. So it's that simple. You guys now know everything you need to know to diagnose eating disorders. Um, that was sort of like, <laughs> I remember my first lecture in eating disorders uh, at the University of Colorado Medical School. I thought my, it was about two hours, you know, during our teaching cycle. And uh, I thought my brain was going to melt. And then, of course, I get to clinic, or actually the inpatient service, and we had an eating disorders unit, you know, and almost none of it looked like that nice, clean, you know, picture. So we'll talk about how do people show up and, and how do we begin to evaluate them? Well, folks present from all different kinds, you know, of walks of life and also situations, treatment situations. Uh, I would say a huge number, you know, present through primary care or pediatric visit um, and the doc says huh you know what's going on here you know you're underweight um, and sometimes they get sent home and told to you know you should eat more um, particularly careful people might take a kind of diet history or give somebody a log and say hey tell me about um, tell me about like what your your daily diet is your daily food intake um, and then track a little bit. And then they might refer to a dietitian or nutritionist out of primary care. And sometimes um, that person might pick up that there's really some abnormal kind of patterns, behaviors, and thoughts about food and might refer for therapy. Um, sometimes, uh, and this has happened twice since I got here to Maui, um, a coach or um, actually it was a physical therapist was the second one referred to us because they were picking up um, hyper exercise and the, and the client was um, passing out during training and uh, they were worried about their nutrition status. Um, and encouragingly, a, a large number of people do still reach out for help. And I think that that's emblematic of some mild reduction in the stigma that people associate with eating disorders. I don't know that percentage-wise that's rising, but um, we still get people who really are asking, at least they're asking like a family member, a parent, a counselor at school, like, hey, I, I might need to talk to somebody. Um, I think during COVID, we, we saw less of that, and now we're beginning to see more, and we're seeing more Gen Z folks uh, reach out for help because they're working hard to reduce stigma um, among that population. A family or friend referral um, happens at times. We do get some adult uh, patients with us who've really been kind of, I don't know what you want to call it, like being given an ultimatum by like a friend or a roommate, like you are going to see somebody or else, you know, we're going to have a conversation kind of thing. And sometimes it works, you know, and, and frequently people say, yeah, they're, they're really like my good friend because they didn't let me get away with saying it's okay, you know. Um, we get a fair number of referrals in, at IPONO from other programs, you know, whether outpatient programs, partial hospitalization programs, which I'll talk about, um, other diagnosis kind of programs like substance abuse, primary psychiatry programs, um, outpatient and intensive outpatient saying, hey, you know, we think they need residential treatment for eating disorders. So we get those referrals. And then um, folks go to the hospital and sometimes it's the primary eating disorder. Um, most hospitals who have, you know, experience and clinicians who do work with eating disorders have a service or at least clinicians who specialize in what's called the malnutrition bradycardia kind of presentation for anorexia. Um, so they get admitted for stabilization, but then sometimes people admit to the hospital and it's found as part of that, even though they were admitted for something else entirely, uh, and then they get referred. So pretty broad range of referral pathways. Um, you know, reaching out for help, uh, usually starts with kind of one, but quickly a person is, is, you know, referred to a team, usually it's the best practice. Um, so sometimes it's their community therapist or reaching out for a dietitian or nutritionist. Maybe they're just trying to eat healthier, at least in their own mind, but things are taking a turn. Um, they might talk to their school counselor, as I mentioned, 
have a psychiatrist or reach out for one because they're experiencing something like depression or anxiety. Um, they talk to a friend or a colleague, family, and a lot of people talk to Dr. Google and ask Dr. Google what to do. Um, and then, and plenty of people have said to me that Dr. Google told them to go to like residential, like Ipono or one of the other programs on the mainland. Um, so the evaluation process, uh, best, best practice is always a multidisciplinary model. There's a bunch of reasons for that. Um, chief among them is it allows, because it's, it's a multidisciplinary problem, it's a multi-systemic problem in that there, there's this medical component, there's a mental component, there's a food and nutrition component. So at least those components need to be addressed in any thorough evaluation and treatment plan. So they should get all those, all three of those things. Uh, thorough medical evaluation. The other thing is you want to rule in and rule out actual medical causes of things. So someone's hunger can go down because they have a problem, for instance, with their thyroid gland, or they might be having an adrenal, a primary adrenal problem, like an adrenal tumor, just those little glands at the top of your kidneys. Um, several different kinds of tumors can cause strange uh, actions in your endocrine system. Um, so you want to rule out those big, bad, but rare things because they're treatable. Almost all are treatable. Uh, also, folks need a baseline health status right at the presentation level so you can track how things are going um, up and down, better or worse, and also assess what level of care do they need. Because still in our current model, the level of care is primarily dependent upon their medical status. And then, of course, you want to pick up, is are they actually in danger right now, right this second? And so do they need, you know, an acute hospitalization to, to get get a hold of things. Um, weight history is absolutely critical. So the, if the best weight history that can be obtained should be obtained. Um, okay, and then we had another question and we'll definitely get back to that one because it's a great question. Um, and then some of the other basic components are, you know, what is, what is the current nutrition status? There's laboratory as well as um, clinical exam aspects of assessing someone's nutrition level and their bone densitometry and a cognitive evaluation. And anything else that seems to be um, important at the time, like for instance, if someone is presenting with bulimic purging episodes, you wanna assess their, their dentition, you know, the state of their teeth, parotid glands, is there inflammation, erosion, things like that, and address those. Sorry, every time I click on the chat, it takes me out of the thing. There we go. Um, second core piece is, of course, a mental health assessment, clinical interview. Um, developing what's called a differential diagnosis. And this is sort of a, a horse that I'm going to be beating for a while um, because uh, I've noticed that the last few years, there's been this kind of like, and I think some of it comes from like television in a way. It's like, these magical doctors on TV can look at someone from the doorway and like one lab or something and, and diagnose this crazy rare unicorn diagnosis, you know, like, oh, it's, you know, pheochromocytoma. How did you not know that? Oh, gosh, excuse me. Um, it's really not that way. You know, actual medicine is developing what we call a differential, which is kind of the top handful of potential diagnoses that could be contributing or could be generating the picture that you see. And, you know, yeah, you have your sort of favorite, your top three. Um, and and then you begin to, the, the process is actually ongoing. And even if you chat, transfer care to someone else, that person picks it up and continues that evaluation process. So evaluation is something that's actually always happening. It never really stops and it's always evolving. Um, and so as you gather data, you know, things get ruled in, get ruled out, and you begin to sort of spiral in towards what's happening. Um, it's complicated because sometimes eating disorders can evolve themselves into something else. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. You also wanna pick up on comorbidities um, of which there can be and are often many, such as depression, PTSD, anxiety, and so forth. I'll talk about that in a second. And then develop what we call in mental health a formulation, which is kind of a broad, thesis of the case, 
um, informs your basis of medical and therapy treatment part of your plan. And the formulation, it's not just one person's responsibility, it's the whole team, um, but every, everyone has a piece. And I would say, you know, the, the psychiatrist or the primary kind of, you know, medicine person kind of forms the core medical and psychiatric thesis, but but really everyone contributes. And that's that's the piece that gets transmitted also when someone transfers care, you know, you should transmit a good formulation and treatment plan to that next you know, treating facility or person. And then they meet, you know, um, hopefully with a, a, a well-trained registered dietitian or nutritionist, uh, assesses their current nutrition status, eating habits, food and nutrition belief systems. And I didn't write, but I should have included sensitivities, any allergies. Um, that can be a little bit challenging too, because sometimes the eating disorder, I'm going to talk about this, in a way is its own entity and can sometimes report allergies and sensitivity that aren't, aren't actually medically present. Um, and so that's part of the assessment process too is, is and why we rely a lot on medical um, assessment as well. And then forming, you know, uh, the initial diet, you know, food plan and food treatment plan because food um, in eating disorders, food is healing, food is medicine. And that's one of the kind of core um, things. And it's not just an anorexia uh, because you're trying to, with all of these disorders, normalize the relationship with food. And all of these things, one of the common elements is that the relationship with food and the body is disturbed. And you're trying to bring it back to kind of a more normal relationship and normal body hunger cues and things like that. So, uh, you know, once we get a sense for where should this person go um, and how to treat them, it's still always a team process. And I want to leave time for questions and answers, and I'm running a long time. Um, but one of the big fundamental task is uncoupling that eating disorder from the sense of character or self and really reinforcing the idea that you are not your disorder. And even though behaviors are technically sort of volitional in that they're conscious, they're really part of the eating disorder itself. And so we often really try and ally, ally with a patient against this malady, against this sort of enemy, you know, this common enemy and separate their identity and, and the sense of blame and shame and guilt from the eating disorder. And some people even name it, you know, like Ed, seriously, you know, things like that. Um, I wanted to get address the, the first question. Um, so really, um, one of the interesting things about eating disorders, is they're sort of mutually exclusive. So if you're anorexic, you are not bulimic. If you have pure binge eating disorder, you don't have other things. If you, you know, are have purging episodes, but you have other eating disorder behaviors, you are not, you know, just purging and you're not just binging. Um, so really, in a way, it's helpful the structure the way it is because you don't end up with these kind of combined. Um, things, although we do have the unspecified eating disorder, if they're kind of presenting this missed bag, but not really meeting criteria for any one thing. But that's usually, that usually evolves as we learn about people and what's going on over time to, okay, we now know really what's kind of going on. Um, I want to address like, how long do you see um, medical complications improve? So um, it's really less time and more like when someone presents undernourished, depending on their level of undernourishment, their, you know, their percentage of ideal body weight um, and other clinical indicators, you know, like bone density, brain, you know, function and things like that. It depends on weight restoration. So it's less time. And so some people can go slower because they're gaining weights more slowly. Uh, and some people can go faster if they weight restore quicker. But some of those changes, like on MRI and some of the cognitive deficits, can take quite a long time to normalize. And women's bone density maximizes in their early 20s. And so if you lose bone density, it's really hard to regain a full, you know, full level normal bone density. It really doesn't come back completely. Um, but we do see uh, the return of uh, normal menstruation cycle after weight restoration, usually they start kind of early once once reaching a, body, a BMI above 17 or 18, um, 
you can see another month or two and then return to menses. Um, I would say weight, you know, and and weight change velocity is one of the easier ways to pick up on people. But one of the messages we need to begin sending when we collaborate with BCPs, but also as patients, is to try and remove the stigma around around weight, and and also removing the idea that if you are a normal weight or overweight, you you have another problem. You don't have an eating disorder. It's really about those thoughts and feelings and behaviors. That's hard to pick up. I don't really have time to talk about levels of care, unfortunately, but suffice to say that it runs the gamut from outpatient team should still be a team, you know, mental health, dietary and primary care medicine, intensive outpatient, more frequent, partial day hospital, residential, and then hospital. Uh, and then there are some specialty care hospital units that really do hard, intense work on weight restoration. And usually they you have to go with non-oral feeding. Um, you know, like tube feeds, alternative feeding, things like that. And um, they can go up and down in these levels of care. So thing, you know, it doesn't just go linear in one direction. So this big green arrow, green arrow thinks that's weird because he likes arrows on one side. Um, so there's a growing specialty area. Uh, the International Association of Eating Disorders Professionals um, certifies eating disorder specialists. Um, it's a long training process. Uh, I have not completed it yet. It's, it's like in there, but if you see someone who has a SEEDS certification as a dietitian, as a psychiatrist, as a, as a medical practitioner, you know that they've committed to really working this specialty. And um, they've gone through education, supervision, and case studies to really get a handle on it. And it's not a psychiatric subspecialty yet, like child and adolescent psychiatry. Um, but I think it should be, and I hope it will be someday. Um, it's a very broad world, eating disorders with several different diagnoses with a very complicated, you know, medical and psychiatric picture. It's as, at least as complicated as substance use disorders, which has its own, you know, fellowship and subspecialty. So lobby your lobby your people, your political people to, to make it that, and we can make it a real specialty in medicine. Um, there's a ton of um, therapeutic milieu and therapy types that are used. The big, the big ones are family-based therapy, especially in adolescence. It's based on, most are based on the Maudsley model, um, but there are others. Um, family-based treatment, you know, got early um, and strong evidence. It can be problematic when for young for young adults and older teens when there's significant conflict within the family because the family based model, the parents are doing the meal support, so they're really like doing the weight restoration support. And if there's a huge amount of conflict or trauma, or someone's been removed from their family, you can't execute that model. So there are a lot of others. Um, Dialectical behavioral therapy is kind of famous in eating disorders. Not enough time to really go into it, but suffice to say, it's it's quite popular in, in a number of treatment settings and also in individual therapy. Um, on Maui, we see a lot of um, different therapies being used, including trauma-focused, CBT, emotion-focused therapy, internal family systems, EMDR and brain spotting, as well as art, music, and movement. Um, when we look in our local environment, um, there's there's no specialized hospital units for eating disorders here, there just aren't. Um, to get that kind of care, we actually have a agreement with Acute Center in Denver to fly patients to the Acute Center um, for medical stabilization when they're that sick. Um, and they have their own plane, they have a jet, it's crazy. Um, but here for general psych, we have an adult psychiatric unit, the Molokini unit. I don't think they specialize in eating disorders, but they can keep people safe. And then Kahi Mohala and Queens Family Treatment Center have clinicians who, you know, are interested in eating disorders, but they don't have a specialty service. As far as residential goes, I think Ipono Maui's is actually the only one. Hope Recovery reports they treat eating disorders, but their primary thing is actually what they call dual diagnosis or psychiatry plus substance use. Um, but I think they have a couple of eating disorders clinicians. Um, Kaiser has 
had has a rather robust out treatment team. Um, Dr. Heather Goff over there is a child and adolescent trained psychiatrist who also has good training in eating disorders and I think she's at IDEP right now. Um, and they have uh, a couple of therapists and nutritionists who work eating disorders specifically. But you have to have Kaiser, obviously. Um, there's Nova Luna up country in Kula here, and they're an outpatient. They used to have a PHP program, um, intensive therapy based program. And then IPONO runs a, a virtual IOP program that I don't really work in particularly. It's it's a much more group and therapy based with a dietitian support program. And then there's a number of people who are in private practice. Um, we always have to be aware of co-occurring disorders. Uh, high rates of depression, anxiety, ADHD, OCD, trauma, and PTSD in our population. And so we, we focus therapy and medication on these co-occurring disorders. Um, stimulants are not absolutely contraindicated, but we gotta be careful with them and make sure that someone actually has ADHD and then stabilize that. And it usually can actually aid in treatment. And then we have to you know, assess when we're having trouble with um, interrelational problems, splitting among staff, you know, is there a personality matrix that is getting in the way of therapy? And there are ways to address that. I don't really have time for medications, but there aren't that many medications that really are helpful for many eating disorders. There's evidence in bulimia for like fluoxetine and olanzapine. Uh, there's a stimulant approved for binge eating disorder. Um, but really everything else is kind of off label and hopeful. There's a little, I saw a study that showed some help with weight specifically for lanzapine with anorexia in 2019. Um, but I didn't look at the methodology yet. So um, I think that's about it. And I'm gonna run soon, but uh, there are a bunch of challenges. The number one is unclear diagnostic picture. And um, so that, that's part of that constant evaluative process. It is okay to diagnose one thing and then realize it's something else. It's fine. And, and we're very direct and open with patients when that happens. Like, you know what, it looked like this before, but really you're reporting and demonstrating being with you every day, you know, that it's really something else. And I think patients really respond well to that. I'm just gonna flip through that. I think there's a significant stigma with the idea, especially if you're not underweight, that you are not sick enough for treatment. And that's something we really work hard against. And one of those things to work on with PCPs is like, weight isn't the only determinant. Um, and that if you are normal or overweight, it's not just, oh, well, you just eat too much, just eat less. That's, that's not really helpful and it's very invalidating. So we really wanna work on that. Um, here's some hopefully helpful websites. I find them really helpful. I go to them a lot actually for data and some of the latest and greatest, and um, the slides can be available. Um, I'll email them to Danielle and you guys can all have them. Perfect. That was a question, Dr. Coles. We did have that. So we um, will definitely send the slides out to you likely on Tuesday when we come back from our three-day weekend. But I wanna thank you very much for uh, this brown bag. It was very informative. And I also did drop in the chat, everybody. Um, we like to do evaluations of our brown bag trainings that helps us bring you the best ones that we can possibly do. So please feel free to click on that link and just do a short evaluation of, uh, of this uh, presentation by Dr. Coles. And then also I put a link to our screening, our national screening from Mental Health America. You can actually do a eating disorder screening or any other mental health condition that you might have interest in, or maybe you think you might um, be looking at yourself or from a family member, but it's free. And it just gives you a little snapshot of your, your mental health with suggestions on, on what to do and go for it from there. So um, thank you so much. And I did want to address, there was one question about support groups um, Yes, for family members. Uh, I'm not, and I would love to know more. Now, occasionally you'll see like an organization say that, you know, we support that, but the problem is um, they open and close or people move and the group starts, then it stops. So I haven't run into any um, that even patients or the clinicians have told me about from like Maui County or neighbor islands that are consistent that have continued to be there. But if you guys learn of any, please let Danielle know. And um, 
we want to we want to build that. But I, I want to recognize that that's the thing that we really need, and that might be something we want to develop with the foundation. So thank you. Again, thank you, Dr. I got to run. Thank you so much, you. guys. Um, appreciate you coming. Aloha. Aloha. Be safe this week. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care.